Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Road to Justice. I'm Katherine Simpson. I'm here today again with Regina A. Bear, mother of Dylan McClendon. Thank you, Regina, for being back with us. Thank you all for having me back. We appreciate it very much. We are here today with the final episode on Dylan McClendon's homicide. This is the part three and the final episode. We are going to bring you the remaining information, and we're also going to talk to you about what you can do at the end of this episode. Um, I want to start out by talking to you about a few other cases and give you some examples. I think that a lot of the citizens don't realize the power that you hold, the ability that you have to affect change in all of these cases. Elected officials are beholden to the voters only, the law and the voters only, no one else. They are there to work for us, all elected officials. This has been evidenced in several cases. For instance, the Mary Pusho case. That case was not going anywhere until the community raised their voices, until Woody Overton put it on his podcast, and we demanded justice in that case. Had the community not stepped up had you not raised your voices, made the phone calls that you made, and gotten involved the way you did, that case was not going anywhere. You held the power and you exercised your power and you got a murderer convicted and sitting in prison. That is no small feat. Also with the Renato case, it was eight years quiet, eight years of nothing until the community got involved and the community made their voices heard and demanded answers. That's when the West Baton Rouge Sheriff's Office got involved. An arrest has been made in that case, and a murderer is sitting in prison. In the Courtney Coco case, that's another one that was on Woody Overton's podcast over in Alexandria in Rapides Parish. When the community gets their voices raised, when you, the voters, step in and demand justice and tell our elected officials that we are not going to stand for any corruption, we are not going to stand for any sweeping of things under the rug, that's when things happen. That is the power that you hold as a voter. As a citizen, you may feel like I'm just one person who may be just a doctor, just a car mechanic, just a housewife, um, you know, just a massage therapist, just whatever. But you're a citizen, you're a voter, and the elected officials work for you. You have the power to affect change, as has been evidenced in all of those cases. You've seen it happen, and you may have been involved. If you were involved, congratulations, you got justice for those families. And thank you for doing that. When a voter, when a citizen calls their representative or calls their senator, they re are responsible to you to respond to you and you alone. You are the only one. There is no one in charge or in power over a sheriff, over the district attorney, as far as I know of, over the coroner, I could be corrected on that, except for the voters. And when something goes wrong that they won't fix, it is left up to us. It is left up to the voters. And that power that you may not realize that you have, you get to use that and you get to bring about positive change for these families. You get to affect justice as a citizen. And that's exciting, isn't it? That's so exciting that you can get involved and that you can do something simply by making a phone call, simply by sending an email to your senator or your representative or making phone calls like were made in the cases of the Coco case, the Renato case, and the Pusho case. That's an exciting thing. Community involvement is so beautiful. It is a beautiful thing to see and I, I just love it. I love it when other voters, other citizens use their voices to get something good done. So I just want to drive home the fact that you do hold power. You hold the ability 
to make things different. And in some cases, you're the only one who can make something different. So congratulations if you've been involved before. And if you have not, you're about to have an opportunity now. So we left off with the story of Dylan McClendon's homicide. We've brought you the timeline. We've brought you the details. Um, We've brought you his family who have shared their story through much pain and many tears. And they've stuck through it and brought their story to you. And let's not let that be in vain. So Dylan McClendon is not a unique case. It is one of the most shocking ones that it's a likely homicide that was overlooked as an overdose, but it is not unique. You may have heard of the case of Joa Ross. His body was found at home and it was assumed that he had overdosed and his body was sent straight to the funeral home. The funeral home found gunshot wounds. That is a homicide that was, and and no autopsy was done for him, no justice will happen for him. So not just Dylan McClendon, not just Joe Ross, but there is also Daryl McRae. He was living at a nursing home and they called that death a natural death due to a heart attack or a heart failure. And the East Baton Rouge coroner's office did not conduct an autopsy. It was not until the West Baton Rouge coroner's office got involved and did do an autopsy that they found out drug dealers were in and out of that nursing home dealing cocaine, the cocaine that led to Daryl McRae's overdose. There's also, there are two other victims, well, three, but the There's two whose families I have not spoken to, so I am not going to give details surrounding their cases, but I can say that Bradley Baxter and Jason Smith both deserved autopsies. Um, Now there's a one, two, three, four, five. There's a sixth one named Damian Paul Skipper. Now he was in the news or his murderer was in the news. His girlfriend was Michelle Hale. This one is a little complicated, but I think we can break it down pretty easily. So Damien Paul Skipper showed up at Our Lady of the Lake emergency room four times in the nine days before his death. He had nausea, gastro issues, kidney issues, low potassium levels. Each time he was uh, treated and released until the last time he was pronounced dead on arrival. No autopsy was done for Damien Paul Skipper. His death certificate was signed and it said the cause of death was heart failure, despite no heart-related troubles on any prior visits. His body was released to a funeral home and he was buried. Six months later, Michelle Hale had a new boyfriend, Arthur Knopflin. I believe I'm saying that right. Um, Arthur Knopflin ended up going to the same hospital, Our Lady of the Lake, twice with the same symptoms as Damien. He was also treated and released. And then in March of 2016, Arthur was found burned up in his truck in New Orleans, which of course prompted an autopsy. When the autopsy was done, it showed barium poisoning in his body. So then Michelle Hale's Ex-boyfriend, Damien Skipper, his body was exhumed and an autopsy was finally done by East Baton Rouge Coroner's Office, uh, Dr. Bo Clark. That autopsy showed that Damien Skipper also died from barium poisoning, not from heart failure. Had Damien Skipper gotten an autopsy in the first place, it is highly possible Arthur Knopflin would still be alive. These things are crucial. This is a crisis within the coroner's department. It isn't just about addicts not getting autopsies. That's not what it's about. Uh, All of these different deaths include different things, different aspects to them. And again, these are homicides that are being mislabeled as overdoses. So I'm going to go on and tell you in 2009... Louisiana legislature established a law that makes it second degree murder to sell someone drugs that killed them. It's Act 155, LRS 30.1, Sections 3 and 4. 
and we'll put it up on your screen, but it states, second degree murder is when the offender unlawfully distributes or dispenses a controlled dangerous substance listed in schedules one through five of the uniform controlled dangerous substances law or in combination thereof to another person who subsequently distributes or dispenses such controlled dangerous substance, which is the direct cause of the death of the person who ingested or consumed the controlled dangerous substance. So in 2009, we have a law created that makes it murder to sell someone a controlled substance that results in their death. So the law surrounding autopsies in that situation Louisiana, and this again will be put up on your screen. Louisiana RS 13 colon 5713 section B.1. The coroner shall perform, shall is a mandatory word, it means he has to. The coroner shall perform or cause to be performed by a competent physician an autopsy in the case of any death, whereas the where there is the reasonable probability that the violation of a criminal statute has contributed to the death. So you can see why it is the law that autopsies be conducted in a suspected overdose case, in a certain overdose case, in any case that that was involving a crime, an autopsy is required. Now in 2017, the president of the Coroner's Association and East Baton Rouge Coroner, Dr. Bo Clark, changed the autopsy policy without announcing it to the public or to anyone else, only within his department. He changed the policy to stop doing autopsies on suspected overdose victims and instead only draw talks and do an external exam. Now, the coroner's office says that this new policy is based on an explosion of overdose deaths and a lack of pathologist. We understand that there is a lack of pathologist and that is a crisis. There is no document nor memorandum that outlines this policy nor dictates who gets an autopsy and who does not. There is no document that could be provided through a public records request that will explain this change of policy in 2017. Law enforcement agencies are accepting the coroner's policy as a green light for them not to do any real investigation in the large majority of these cases. And that goes for Dylan's case. In Dylan's case, the investigation into his death led to the arrest of four people, Five people? Total of four. Total of four people. However, those charges failed. Dylan had, did Dylan get an autopsy? No, he did not. And did you guys assume that he did get one? Yes, you we assumed. did. We assumed. Um, because we thought that That's was how it goes. How it goes. Um, even when we were allowed to see him at the. We went to make um, his service arrangements. They let us see him while they were prepping him. And I don't know what somebody looks like when they get an autopsy, but they pulled the sheet down, and he had staples from here all the way down. Mm -hmm. That really confirmed our assumption that it looks like that happened from the autopsy. So when did you find out that no autopsy was done? Uh, late December, very late December, and that only came by accident. Um, Lieutenant Henning called to tell me that they got the toxicology back because we thought fentanyl, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and he confirmed that, you know, fentanyl wasn't in it or in what Dylan ingested, um, And it was that phone call I asked, well, what about the autopsy? What the autopsy say? And it was at that moment that I was informed there wasn't an autopsy. Were you shocked? Yeah, there was like dead silence Mm -hmm. for a couple of minutes. 
because when when these people who are charged with the second degree murder of Dylan McClendon, when they get to court and there is no autopsy, there is no way to prove how he died. Any defense attorney will get their client off on murder fast, quick, and in a hurry with no autopsy. It, it kills the case instantly without an autopsy. Um, and then as time went on, you had hope when they were arrested. You were, you were very hopeful when the four boys were arrested and then the actual drug dealer, when it, the grand jury was coming up. That had to be, I don't want to say ex- exciting, but hopeful for you and your family. Hopeful, yes, because we were told about the arrest of the actual dealer that sold to the boys who gave or sold to Dylan if $20 was involved. $20. Um, We were never told that the three boys' charges would go away Mm -hmm. once Drashawn Taylor was brought into it. Mm -hmm. Um, We thought we had like a double, you know, win-win situation. Mm -hmm. So nobody really came out and told us straight that the boys would not face any charges. We Mm -hmm. just picked up on vibes and conversations here and there until after the grand jury, and we were told, you know, this is it. The grand jury pre-terminated. And until somebody comes forward with more evidence to go forward, it's open, Mm -hmm. but this is it. So that's when we knew 100% the boys, nothing. We we questioned about the um, Good Samaritan Law. Mm Mm-hmm. We said, what about the Good Samaritan law? Because I think we discussed they did not call 911 for Dylan. Correct. And I was told by the assistant DA that was prosecuting the case that they could not use the Good Samaritan law because 911, in fact, was contacted. And I said, but 911 was not contacted for Dylan. Right. And I was told, no, but they were contacted for Baylor. And if they weren't contacted, then Baylor would have passed away, too, which what that has to do with Dylan is beyond me. And by the time they called 911, Dylan was dead, according to the coroner's own estimate. That's a few hours. So there's no way the Good Samaritan law should apply. They allowed him to die prior to calling 911. Which had nothing to do with them calling for Baylor. That is why they called. So Mm -hmm. that was a little. So you were given a lot. You were given the runaround. Oh, absolutely. You were given all kinds of information to make you confused. And uh, a lot of information to muddy the water. And information that didn't make sense. And you caught on. Um, Not always, if any elected officials happen to be watching, not always are you dealing with dummies who don't understand. Sometimes you are dealing with citizens who actually have a brain and can see through the BS. And that's what happened in this case. You guys caught on. You knew what was happening. And do you feel as though if Dylan had gotten an autopsy, it would have gone differently? Yes, Mm -hmm. I do. I do because... It would have proven the minute amount of heroin that was in his system. 5.1 nanograms. It would have um, confirmed what we saw externally, what was probably going on internally. And it would have answered all the, the weird questions we have now. Why, you know, the... Petechial more hemorrhaging. Significant petechial significant. hemorrhaging. The bleeding out of the nose, the red mark on his face, everything. The lividity and, down the front. Yeah. When and they, you know, and I get it because I've done my research. In um, cases of strangulation or asphyxiation, significant or any petechial hemorrhage is one 
of the external um, signs. signs. Mm-hmm. And it's not always right away. You will get signs. You will get bruising. You will get... So if they looked at him and did not see that, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Right. You do not immediately show all signs of strangulation. It can be hours. It could be days. Mm -hmm. So that theory that they looked him over, did an external examination, which they did not do, but even if they externally looked him over, it's they still, wouldn't. There's a high possibility they wouldn't have seen that. He died. Yes. So if, you know, if so, he was suffocated, I don't know what they would have seen externally. So as they decided in 2017 to rely on an external exam and tox only, clearly that's not working. The external exam showed the one, what they did anyway, the external ex- exam showed significant petechial hemorrhaging, lividity down the front when, according to the story, he was never on his front side. And the external, nose bleeding. the nose bleeding, and not to mention the toxicology report did not come back until four days after Dylan had been buried. So clearly relying on an external exam and a toxicology report is not enough. Not to butt in, but when you do an external exam, if you opt to do that in place of an autopsy, it should, and I've mentioned this, it should at least include a core body temperature. Absolutely, yes. That wasn't even done. No. So that we don't even have that. That they could never directly give us an estimate time of death mm-hmm. in the report. Because mm-hmm. they didn't do certain things. But an external exam, yeah, you do a, a core body temperature if right. you're not going to do an autopsy. Right. And again, Dylan's case is not unique. This is the case that we have gotten into, that we have given you the deep details on. But there are six others just that we know about, just that I've got files about. And who knows how many others. So the Coroner's Association is in crisis. They only have, I believe, 11 practicing pathologists when they need at least 19 or 21. I don't remember the exact number, but the point is we are remarkably short on pathologists. So the solution to this crisis is not to just stop doing autopsies. The solution is to, it's, it's a basic supply and demand issue that all societies have dealt with since the inception of society. There are answers to this problem. They are not being found, these answers, by our elected officials. So we are going to come to you, the voters, and ask you to use that power that we talked about at the beginning of this episode. You have the power to affect change. What you can do is email your representative. We're going to ask you to email or phone call Representative Bacala and Representative Joseph Marino. They can get the coroner's office more funding for more pathologists, get them more room for more freezers. They can solve the crisis. And we're going to put up on your screen two graphics that came from the state coroner's convention in Lafayette this past weekend. They call this a crisis, the shortage of pathologists. Catherine did not call it a crisis. The coroner's association is calling this a crisis. But to do something about it, someone has to speak up. Someone has to be willing to make a phone call, send an email. So what we've done is create a template email. That way we've taken the work out of it and we have, all you have to do is enter in the date and your name. And if you would copy and paste this email and send it to Representative Bacala or Representative Joseph Marino, that will go a long way 
towards getting this crisis solved. All these families who don't have justice, the victims themselves who have died, their mom and dad, their brother and sister, their children, their families. These are people that you know, live with, work with. These are people in your community who are murdered and they don't have justice and you can do something about it. We are going to put up on your screen a script for a phone call. If you can make a phone call, that would be incredible. That would be amazing. That's what I like to do. Um, if you would prefer to send an email, we are going to put up a script for an email. All you have to do is fill in the date and your name, like I said. And if we can get as many people as possible to respond to this, we can get this crisis solved. And the next person who dies, that may be your friend, that may be your coworker, that may be you, won't have the problems uh, achieving justice that are rampant right now. So I've, uh, we've already talked about the Courtney Coco case, the Mary Pusho case, the Sandra Renato case. You guys did that. You did that. You brought about justice in that case using your voice and your power as a citizen. And that is what we are asking you to do now for Regina, for Dylan, for Shannon, for Kevin, for his brothers. You can do this. All you have to do is care. So if you would join us in this call to action, there will be no retaliation against you for simply asking the representatives to get the coroner's office what they need in order to solve this crisis. You won't be retaliated against. You will not be in trouble. This is, you are the only one who can do it. You are the only ones. And it's gonna take more than just me. It's gonna take more than just Regina. It's gonna take more than just Dave. It's gonna take a lot of us. And we can get their attention and get this problem solved. Regina, why don't we end this by telling me a little bit about Dylan. Tell me what your favorite memory is of him as a child or as an adult. Mm -hmm. He was a, a clown. <laughs> it's funny. Um, after the, I don't know, the trailer that played the other night, a friend of his texted me. <laughs> she, she said, I always have to leave you with a smile. And it was a video of him dancing. <laughs> no. And he was just shaking and singing. And he turned around and he noticed she was videoing. <laughs> And he said something I'm not going to repeat on camera. And I needed that that night. Oh, and I, I literally, I laugh for 30 minutes. Um, and then, of course, motocross. That, motocross, that was, and yes. Dylan left family. That was a family thing. It's what we did. It's, yeah. You know. Dylan was a great kid. Dylan was not, it, being an alcoholic is not what defined Dylan. Family defined Dylan. Dylan's love for life defined him. The same with all of these other victims. And when there is something that you can do, something as simple as sending an email, making a phone call, exerting that power that you have, you may not know you have it, but you have it. When there's something that simple that you can do, we are going to beg you to join us. We are going to give you all of that information for you to do. And we are going to get back with you on what the results are and what we managed to get changed in this situation. Regina, I am so impressed by your strength. I am so touched by your pain. I know that you feel the same pain that all of these other victims feel. I will never know what it is like to lose a child. I, my mother was murdered, and, and so I can relate to the frustration, but I'll never know what that pain is like. And if that pain touches you, please reach out. Please make, make the phone call. Send the email. It can be done. It's been proven. You've proved it. And I have faith in you. I believe in the roadies. I believe in the victims. I believe in the citizens. Elected officials are beholden to us only. You have power. 
We are asking you to use it for the sake of Regina and all of the other victims. This has been Katherine Simpson and Dave Kay with Road to Justice. We will see you soon. Thank you.